Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for staying with us um, on this exciting day, uh, day two of the CMOG seminar. And I just have to say how exciting it was to see uh, the glass uh, demonstrations just before. And it really does speak to the fact that uh, to understand how glass is made, you really have to see it being uh, demonstrated live. So I really appreciate that. So I'll be moderating panel three, which is on the cultural practices of glass. And we'll start off this afternoon with Suzanne Phillips, a PhD student at the University of Buckingham. And she'll be presenting on Francis Edgington, a satellite in the orbit of the lunar circle. So Suzanne. Oh, I think you're still muted. There you go. I am. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, I wanted to talk today about the possibly less explored periods of British architectural glass art, as well as one of the forgotten practitioners in that medium, Francis Edgington. I also thought that Edgington would be an interesting subject as he could be used to draw out uh, a number of themes. Um, could I have the next slide, please? That's great. Um, the first theme is to do with um, networking and connectivity, not least with Edgington's relations with members of the lunar circle. Now, earlier on, Kit spoke about the dilettante group in his introductory speech for the day. The lunar circle, I think, was nothing like the dilettantes. They, this group were, were not noblemen. They weren't really classicists, and few of them had undertaken a, a grand tour. I think we are beginning to talk about self-made men, aspirational men, entrepreneurs, and industrialists. And this slide just gives you a flavor of a few of the people in that circle, um, not forgetting that scientists and artists perhaps collaborated a lot more widely in the 18th century, and that's already been mentioned. So we have thinkers and educationalists like Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of Charles Darwin. We have Joseph Priestley, the great nonconformist and supporter of both the French Revolution and independence for America. In fact, that, that is where he ended up in America because his thinking was so unpalatable in, in Britain. We have Josiah Wedgwood and Matthew Bolton, both entrepreneurs and industrialists and inventors. We have Benjamin West, born an American, but known as a painter in Britain and a painter for the royal family. We have Angelica Kaufman, one of the first female members of the Royal Academy. And um, Francis Edgington in one of his other in, incarnations before he began glass painting, worked as an engraver and quite often reproduced Angelica's pictures for wide sale. Francis Edgington had the good fortune to marry into the Wyatt family. Again, another very useful connection. James Wyatt, another president of the Royal Academy, was the architect of the day in Britain. All of these up and coming people enabled Edgington to be in with the monarchy and other elites and opinion formers. And I've put King George III down there. That is actually a glass painting of George III and on an architectural scale. It's probably about 90 inches by 60 inches. It's quite large, not by Edgington, but I, I thought it was worth mentioning that. So it's the theme of connectivity and, and networks in making sure that um, there was quite a wide outreach in Britain for painted glass. May I have the next slide? Thank you. 
The Lunar Circle were interested in politics, enlightenment, religion, and invention. There's a snapshot here of what was going on. So top left, you have the steam engine, Matthew Bolton's great collaboration with James Watt, Francis Edgington, before he became a glass painter, was probably involved in helping to die cast for some of the components that helped manufacture steam engines. Below that, you have images of canals that helped the products that were produced by this circle reach all parts of Britain and from there to be traded around the world. Below that, I couldn't resist an image to showcase the American Revolution. And if you can see the French flag, top right, you will see that was happening in the background as well. Below the French Revolution, you have a press for making coins. Matthew Bolton and Francis Edgington were involved in the production of money, which had quite an important role in trade all around the world. The other two images I've left till last, the image in the center top is am I not a man and a brother within the lunar circle you had Josiah Wedgwood most of them were heavy supporters of abolition of slavery but that was a very nuanced and ambiguous pro approach in 18th century Britain it wouldn't prevent them from trading with, with slavers, if they could sell a steam engine or a set of Wedgwood tableware to a slaver, of course they, they would. And nuanced even further, did you mean abolition of slavery in Britain alone or did you reach out to the colonists? So there was a degree of ambiguity there. The final picture is a picture of Bonnie Prince Charlie. So we're talking there about the Jacobite rebellion and in British politics that was um, still very much fresh in the memory where the Hanoverian King George III could potentially have lost his throne to the Catholic pretender Charles Stuart. I mention this because I do think that English 18th century glass painting with its modernity was less linked to what you might call Catholic medieval and leaded mosaic glass painting. And I can't help thinking that Francis Edgington aligned to the Protestant glass painting could find um, a wider market in politically sensitive Britain at the time. May I have the next slide, please? We have here some examples of cultural practices of illumination. I'm honing in on science and spectacle, and it's possible that some of the other presenters later in this session will deal with this in rather more detail. But top left, you have an illustration of one of the Argand lamps that was manufactured by the industrialist Matthew Bolton. And this was a great scientific invention. It would produce the light of at least six to 10 candles, which in Georgian Britain, if not around the world, certainly on the continent in Europe, that, that, that was a big thing. I, I suppose we, we can't think too much about how a brighter, steadier light would have made such a difference in, in Georgian homes. The other um, spectacle that we have there top right is the an illustration of the Ido Fusican, um, that, that great Georgian forerunner of the IMAX or of the cinema where painted glass along with sound effects and lighting effects was um, used to great entertainment used for great entertainment purposes to Georgian audiences who I think would pay a shilling for the privilege of watching a show. The third slide, um, the third image at the bottom is, is, is simply an illustration of, of the firework display that I think was on the River Thames and may well have accompanied um, a performance of one of Handel's musical 
productions. This, I think, is another interesting example of how Georgians were interested in manipulating light and darkness. Then, if I may, could we move on to the next slide? My final theme, I think, is to do with architecture and the move from neoclassicism neo into Gothic revival during the 18th century period. And in this one, I would like, if I may, to draw your attention to the image on um, the bottom right. This is some of the remaining glass at the Great Folly that was Font Hill, built for William Beckford, whose father was a great slaver in the Caribbean. So Font Hill was funded entirely from the proceeds of slavery. It is thought, in fact, that Edgington's combined fee for all of the painted glass he produced for Font Hill came to about 12,000 guineas. If I may, a little bit about the technique of glass painting. The images were rendered onto sheets of plate glass using fired enamels. And this meant that there was a manipulation and moderation of transmitted light to enable the viewer to see the, the image so that the glass in effect acted as an illuminated canvas that is, I think, quite different from some of the things that we've seen in earlier sessions and presentations, particularly if you're talking about reverse paintings on, on mirrors. So I think that the viewer of a an image on painted architectural art glass is, is going to receive a very, very different experience there. A quick word about Francis Edgington and why he is such an interesting character. He did not start his career as a glass painter. He was linked with the lunatic circle, most particularly with Matthew Bolton, and was involved in the production, not only of industrial technological things like steam engines and um, the hardware to produce coinage, but also objets d'art, including silver. And he took up glass painting at a fairly late stage in his career, possibly when he married into the, the Wyatt architectural dynasty. The, I suppose the reputation that he, he gained through Matthew Bolton meant that when he did become a, gl a glass painter, he had a pre-made audience and a pre-made brand, which is what at the time made him quite famous and quite celebrated. I think I should stop there, Iris, but I, I hope that was a good flavor of um, the, the recorded presentation, which I hope everyone will see. And indeed, if they want to see more images of um, painted glass, the more will come up later. I think it's worth going to the talk. So thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, next, we have Sammy Lu Lukic Scott, um, who is a PhD candidate at the University of York. And she will be presenting on illuminating images, the role of glass in developing reproductive translucent images in the long 18th century. All right, thank you, Iris. And can I have my first slide? Great, thank you. Uh, so my paper explored a range of translucent reproductions in the long 18th century to examine a common language of glass and glassiness and its role within this multimedia culture where manipulating translucency was this key area of experimentation. Uh, we can see this in the reproduction of a variety of images, such as this painted glass translation by William Collins of Francis Danby's opening of the sixth seal. Painted glass, as Suzanne has already um, explored, uh, actually involving these sheets of enamel uh, painting, we're able to reproduce the subjects of other paintings a lot more directly than other stained glass designs, for instance. 
where the lead would uh, more often interrupt the image. Next slide. So my research particularly focuses on the movement of images across media, where print culture is invariably a key link. Uh, these versions of Danby's image all have significant differences, uh, most notably in color and framing effects. The luminosity of the painted glass means that it really does stand out more than the other versions. The translucency of this painted glass means that it's the, the way that it relies on, the way that it manipulates light is just really key to how it creates this pictorial uh, display compared to that of the uh, opaque images. It's, it's just such a different construction. Next slide. Um, so another famed instance of reproduction across media, uh, which I think Suzanne mentioned in her presentation as well, uh, was that of the Virtues painted by uh, Thomas Gervais and designed by Joshua Reynolds for New College at Oxford. The image in the upper right depicts a reproduction of the virtues and a transparency displayed by Rudolf Ackerman outside his premises on the Strand to commemorate the piece in June 1814. As with painted glass, this transparency relied on the manipulation of light to achieve a luminous effect with enhanced colours. Like the change of framing for the Danby image, the virtues are translated into a new object, altered to take the form of a historical monument. The personified virtues no longer accompanying a religious scene, but instead repurposed as a means to celebration. And you, we do see this a lot um, with the translation sort of to and from glass, the way that these images are framed, where they're often sort of made into more of an object or given more of a decorative frame. It's, it's, it's a very regular interplay. Um, such public transparencies had a deliberately social experience that also linked to the similar, similarly illusionist illusionistic effects that were a key part of the culture of the spectacle at this time. Next slide, please. So this intentional creation of a particular viewing experience can particularly be seen in the creation of lithophanes and so moving away from glass, but I think in a very relevant way. So on this slide, there's a lithophane of the much reproduced um, Madonna della Sedia, originally by Raphael, of course, um, which is just on the left here as well as additional examples of this image being reproduced across glass. The lithophane shown here is made from porcelain, which was the most common material used. So these are only a few millimeters thick. The reverse of the lithophane is smooth while the front is a really intensely molded relief surface. At the first sight, it's often hard to make out the design, but once it's backlit, this sort of illusory image uh, is revealed and a, a grayscale image of some color, but usually a grayscale image is seen to appear. So this is achieved through the thickest areas of porcelain letting through the least light to provide the darkest tonal areas while the thinner areas of porcelain transmit the most light to actually get the light, lightest tonal areas in this illusory image. Despite usually being made from porcelain, um, accounts of lithophanes consistently register surprised at the fact that they're not made from glass. Discovering the roots led, usually sort of led to reactions of admiration and sometimes amusement, more fun than amusement to begin with, that these objects were not glass. Um, objects that were so reliant on translucency are usually expected to be made from glass. And I'm not trying to say that sort of um, 18, uh, 19th century viewers were ignorant of this. It's something which is very much some, today when we're viewing these, you expect them to be glass because of how they're behaving, how they're looking. And it's, it's, it's a reaction that so many people have. Um, it's one that is also very, Interesting, also problematic for research because of the amount that mis are misidentified as glass um, throughout the centuries. Um, but I think that in itself is actually really important. Um, uh, next slide, please. These reproductions explore a variety of imagery, ranging from old masters to contemporary paintings and prints. Um, again, smaller things here, not that I have a particular bias, of course, um, but it's notable that there's a strong religious context to a lot of these images that I've already shown you. We see this a lot in the painted glass that's still in situ, precisely because a lot of this is in churches, um, and so the religious imagery carries through with that. A lot of the more secular stained gla um, painted glass didn't always survive, same as transparency, especially if they're on paper, that's not a particularly durable material, and especially if they're thought of sometimes as very transient effects, they, they want, might not always have been kept. Um, but this of course is a very much a snapshot. Um, I think I've almost every genre I've seen reproduced um, in, in this research, which I have to say just go across uh, all sorts of different material going moving from glass to metal, ceramics, it's 
the place embroidered pictures as well. Uh, more, more common, I think, is actually the enhancement of a really strong light source, like in the central image of Vesuvius, um, where this reliance on translucent media is just really made explicit. It makes a really dramatic effect, and it's very self referential when actually thinking about its relationship with light and how important it is to actually sometimes the understanding of images. Next slide, please. Uh, so Vesuvius, of course, is also a much repeated subject uh, across all media in this period. Translucent media was definitely have a, just able to add this sense of drama and theatricality by intensifying the effect of the eruption more so than uh, non-illuminated media. We can see the reverse colouring of this print that was likely intended to act as a transparent print with areas of varnish that would then be used to make certain areas of the paper more translucent to reveal an Im illuminated image once backlit. Um, transparent prints are a really interesting example of the role of varnish in imitating glassiness. Um, I should mention as well, some lithophanes, um, although not originally designed as such, some have since been glazed or some at the time were glazed as well. So again, we have this sheen on the surface, the idea of glassiness is enhanced there as well. Um, going back to these, uh, the varnish on these prints, often this was only a very small part of the image where the sheen of the varnish would actually draw attention to that part of the image and help the viewer to identify the print as one that needed to be backlit. The sheen alluded to the presence of the material properties of glass being used in this paper image. So glass was key both in a material sense of adding luminosity, sheen or permanence, as well as actually providing the language needed to discuss these new effects in media. So translucency is very much investigated as not just a property of glass now, but a tool for a variety of makers to exploit and experiment with. And I will finish there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy. Um, and now we'll hear from Dr. Anne Smart Martin, uh, Stanley and Polly Stone Professor of American Decorative Arts and Material Culture at the University of Wisconsin, and she will be presenting on Blaze Creators, a Material Culture of Lighting and Surfaces in 18th Century Domestic Interiors. And I think you might be muted. Oh, my goodness. Uh, there you go. Back on. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I, like I do this all the time to teach, so I'm sorry about that momentary problem. Anyway, I wanted to thank um, Kit Maxwell and the Queen Museum of Art of uh, Community of Glass uh, for this wonderful opportunity to speak with you today and hear from these wonderful speakers. Um, my talk is part of a larger project to examine how light was created, augmented, transformed, experienced, and really look at those two centuries before um, electricity. So two themes are the marvels of, of reflection and the problems of gleam and shimmer and all the ways also about how and, uh, artificial lighting changed everyday life. Um, finding sources, particularly about that experience of lighting, but particularly trying. So I'm looking forward to any good ideas from you as well. In the process, and next slide, please. Um, in this process, I came across two so-called it narratives were glass and light with a story. And so I'm using these, um, I'm using these narratives as a way to um, understand a little bit more about glass and light. And first, I'm looking, talking about one that's called The Diamond Pen and the Farthing Candle. And that's a clever poem published in the Philadelphia Gazette in 1794. And it's a fable of vanity and social politics with its act, its pen and candle. And they're using the dualistic nature of reflection as its foil. So in this dialogue, the, the diamond pen is this really kind of saucy, proud brooch or pen who is insulting and sneering at this uh, far a tallow candle that was left there accidentally by the cleaning lady. But alas, when the flames were finally extinguished, Miss Pen was lost. And she could only search for her despite her departed radiance as sadly because each sparkle was swallowed in the depth of shade. The tables were turned and the lowly candle could now gloat. Um, so show some reverence for your blaze, blaze creator, which was the candle. Next slide, please. In a parallel public scene, 
published in 1766, the false doing a diamond bantered and jostled about superiority in the shop window lit for the evening. And it's a long piece there, but you can look at the, the first um, section, first paragraph. Um, it says, within, within a toyman shop at night, resplendent by the taper's light, a foil stone hung to make a show, as glittering things attractive you. So at this point, it's the foil stone who's boasting about his greatness. So in this joust, though, the diamond is the winner because she was by nature's hand formed to shine, but the paste jewelry's uh, present superficial glow was all due to the taper candle. So the squabbling aside, all, all these stories, the two baubles here um, serve the same function. They're part of this, serving as part of this larger glittering tableau of candles and glass to attract some consumers to the window. So both of these stories are so-called part of so-called it narratives. Um, it's a special form of literature flourishing in the later 18th century. And in this kind of writing, objects become a kind of narrators of action, often telling fables where things act as humans or have biographies. Now this kind of writing become the objects, become narrators and they're telling fables. Um, they might observe the world around them. Um, they might, might be in varying situations where humans were observed. So it could be black coat, a corkscrew, coins, uh, paper. And I like these two stories indeed because they have that, the two forms of glass were critical to the narrative. So the first case, the tallow candle was cheap and messy. The diamond uh, called it nasty and disparaged it. It was like poor people in general. In the first case, the diamond is put in place um, by everyday people like the cheap candle. In the second case, it was the fake and falsy showy um, uh, stone that received the comeuppets. Each object preens and brags like shiny elites. In the other, the fake was falsely showy and not natural was falsely pride, falsely proud. So I ultimately frame, frame this interest in terms of the role of diamonds and plastic jewels, uh, which Marsha Point and others have written about. But what I'm really interested behind this is the way that surfaces are manipulated and how faux surfaces become rather kind. Um, slide number three, please. And I use this example here of a John Singleton Copley portrait from 1763, where Julie was really astonishing. Um, rubies and diamonds, fit with this remarkable portrait with the, with the silk dress, the copious lace, um, exactly the kind of portrait to display the father's rather astonishing wealth. And I'll add that the, the, the um, uh, water here is part of this idea of fecundity as well as the garden behind her. I might add that I went through and I started and I looked more of, into um, these ideas about jewelry. And can I have the next slide, please? And I pull up here the pair of floral brooches um, that were French um, that's in the Corning Museum of Glass. And this contrast is where I'm really looking at the way in which diamonds uh, function within the society at large. Um, and there's some wonderful work being done on that as well. Um, I also was kind of interested in the kind of jewelry that was available to the more middling sorts. And I look at uh, some store records um, that um, included different kinds of jewelry like this. None of them were paste or real jewels, but other ways to approximate. Um, and I might add that paste buckles were the only kind of uh, paste or imitation that I found. So I'm generally trying to think about faux surfaces and reflection, and both show their own way in which artificial illumination was a form of its own wealth. So thank you, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, thank you so much, Anne. Um, I think I might actually have a couple of slides um, if I can bring those up. Um, so I really enjoyed listening to all three of your presentations, um, the recordings, and as well as your summaries. I just wanted to start with Suzanne's presentation, and could you actually move to the next slide? Sorry. So I was looking for slides of um, St. Paul's, oh, sorry, I'm actually going to forward one more slide. <laughs> I was looking for images of the uh, painted glass that Edgington had done for St. Paul's in Birmingham. And I, I found sort of three versions, uh, if you will, of his uh, painted glass. And what struck me was really, you know, in the, in the course of all the papers that we've seen, we started off with 
the sort of technology of glass and how it was really transparency, clarity, um, the fact that you can see through the glass as an architectural surface that really um, was the reason why it was so prized in the early modern world. And then, you know, by the end of the 18th century, when the technology has been sort of mastered, um, it suddenly is uh, being exploited as a painterly surface. And so it's not so much about the transparency per se, but the kind of play with transparency and obstruction that I find so fascinating, but also um, the sort of variability in the medium, right? It's not a constant surface that always looks the same, um, which is something that you might find with porcelain, for example, in some of the pieces that you showed, Sammy, but it's actually changing constantly with the light and also depending on who you are. Um, one thing that really struck me across all three papers was this question of a kind of Protestant aesthetic, if you will. Um, Suzanne, you mentioned that uh, Edgington was sort of working against the kind of Catholic, um, you know, Jacobite sentiments, and you know the fact that most of the glass was coming out of this sort of stained glass tradition with the medieval period, and he was really trying to sort of convert that. Um, and something that really struck me uh, in your comments was you know, he was coming out of a kind of industrial Midlands aesthetic, right? So it was the lunar circle and not the dilettante. So it was very much a kind of embracing of uh, industrial production um, and the kind of proto mass production that would give birth to the industrial revolution. And I just found it so fascinating to think of that site as a, as a site of production for different kinds of art. And Sammy, this actually connects to many of the pieces that you showed, especially that um, incredible uh, opening of the sixth seal. I'm actually wondering if we can go back. I, I realize it might be a little complicated, but um, if we can go back to Sammy's slides or not. In any case, um, I think this is fine. So, but this, this idea that reproduction, right? You're producing the effects of glass, not only in prints, but also prints are being transposed to this transparent medium, I think again is coming out of this industrial aesthetic, right? So instead of this sort of Royal Academy language where painting is painting, sculpture is sculpture, and it exists within this very hierarchical context, what you're actually getting is this kind of um, transmedial uh, sort of intermedial um, realm where they're really experimenting with different kinds of um, effects and spectacles and, and, and the like. And then finally, Anne, I thought your uh, presentation was so fascinating because again, again, it's coming out of that sort of um, industrial context or the sort of commercial context uh, where it's not only about sort of the rise of the novel or, or, or whatnot, but it's also about objects themselves taking on um, lives and sort of having lives and this notion that you know the light itself literally brings objects alive alive i thought was a really fascinating aspect of your presentation um but i guess if we can uh go ahead to questions um so one thing that i was struck by um again if we sort of think about the overall arc of the presentations we're looking at the kind of dissolution of glass as that enlightenment paradigm, right, of transparency, reason, rationality, um, and um, enlightenment and progress. And I kept on thinking about how this sort of romantic spirit is coming into play. And I, I suppose this is addressed mainly to Suzanne and Sammy, but how do you think the spectator um, was meant to sort of approach glass painting differently from, say, oil painting? Um, so I, th I think what you were um, sort of talking about, I was start with the the, the, um, the differences in the glass painting of how it's viewed, um, and, and like you said, there's so many different ways to view it. That's something that I found in all of the media that I looked at, even especially of lithophanes. If they're not lit properly, you can see they're sculptural. So it, the, it's really important, uh, even with the transparent prints as well. If you shine a really bright light behind it, then it actually obliterates a lot of the detail in the print. Same with some painted glass. If it's a really bright sun, then sometimes you can't see some details. 
uh, the image that I have of Danby's um, six there was actually a really cloudy day, but it just, it was just the right place. I managed to get those beautiful illumination. So the, the image appeared really strong. Um, and I think for me, it, it's so linked to the spectacle, the fact that it's it's this illuminated experience, it's very deliberate. These images have to be backlit in a certain way to be viewed in often sort of the right way or to see the image in its truest form. We often see that sort of comment coming up a lot. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's very much an artistic discourse, but the fact that there's such an um, exact viewing experience for many of these. Um, the fact that transparency, you know, they're, they're advertised, you have to see it at this time of night, that's when it will look best. And you have the same sort of conversation um, and sort of, like I've seen sort of a lot of, no examples coming to mind, but a lot of churches. This is a time when you want to visit it to see this specific window, but you might want to come back to see this window at the other end of the church. And it's something that I think people are really aware of, this, this very necessary aspect of the viewing experience. Which is fascinating because then the church becomes kind of an entertainment mm. spectacle in a really interesting way. Um, Suzanne, yeah. did, you, did you want to? Oh, it's a great question. So many things to, to unpack. I, I wondered, if you mentioned romanticism, but I, I do think um, that there's a degree of, of technological limitations, but when the um, Eddington and other Georgian glass painters um, started i i think there was a neoclassical there were there were some neoclassical principles if you have a look at the window it it is rationally constructed it it is not the leaded mosaic um kind of random um display it every, every pane of glass is a uniform size that would um I suppose, align with the proportions of a, of a neoclassical building, which is quite interesting. Um, I think that as far as um, the lunatics were concerned or, or people who had any, any scientific thinking, including about the properties of light, they would perhaps think about some sort of mastery over, or at least a dialogue with, with nature, that you could control light. You, you could use light to um, change the, the viewing experience. And often um, a, a, a glass painting would um, take advantage of a point of light with, within the image. Um, if you, you have a look at the virtues, they're, they're all looking in a certain direction up to a point of light. If you look at um, St. Saint, Saint Paul, the light coming down of, on St. Paul for his conversion is, is, is a focal point. The light coming through the glass would have been used in that way. And um, similarly with the, the other image that you pulled up, which is fascinating, which was, Eddington's re repurposing of, of Guido Reni's assumption of the Virgin to become another of the virtues, faith. You're looking at, at that point of light and, and you're absolutely right. As Sammy has mentioned as well, during the day, your, your perception of that image would change depending on the light outside. And if it was viewed in exhibition, artificial light, then um, the person controlling that that display could could modify the image for you, depending on how they placed the candles or the argon lamps or even the mirrors, enhancing the light behind the candles to give to give the viewer a, a completely spectacular e experience. So sometimes it was touch and go, sometimes it was it was control, but they they were game to experiment. I, I think that's another nice thing about the 18th century. Absolutely. And I just wonder too, do you th do, does he have any sort of commentary about this Protestant Catholic issue? Because it's because Guido Reni, of course, is making paintings in that Catholic tradition. And I just wonder, did he, did Edgington do anything specifically to make it more Protestant? Yes, he did. He, he completely, um, changed the the iconography on um, the the, the Guido Reni assumption of the virgin it's exactly the same face it's the same um figure in in the same pose but um 
the Virgin is, is looking up, surrounded by angels, by the host, taking her up to um, heaven. Um, there's a lot of Marian blue there, but Edgington worked completely to change the iconography. So you have a cup, a crown and a cross. He's put his figure now repurposed as faith in a, a landscape, perhaps an allegorical landscape and he's changed the color scheme so the marian blue is there but it's just a little bit of of her stash and i i think sammy may have similar things about how um if if you will the the, the religious virtues um faith hope and charity were, were catholic virtues as much as um later protestant virtues that they suddenly have a very different iconography with, within um, the Reynolds scheme because the, the virtues um, were, 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 were taken from um, paintings, designs from, from Joshua Reynolds. So there's a, there's a great deal of playfulness um, going, going on there to, to make things, I think, more, more palatable to a Protestant, a Protestant country because of the politics of the time. Mm, that's absolutely fascinating. So moving sort of transatlantically, moving to the American context, and uh, I was curious about these it narratives, and do we have any kind of commentary about who was reading them and how they were reading them? I, I mean, did they read them as kind of fables or allegories? Um, with a moral or were they simply entertaining kind of um, diverting texts? I think it's both. I think it's the idea that it serves all these different functions and to why they're popular um, has diverged. As you mentioned, the idea that they are popular because there's this new swirling of new kinds of consumer goods and fitting back to this idea of enlightenment that these many of these things didn't fit with. Some of these basic ideas that people understood, they were confusing, they were, what do we think about them? So that's one parallel. Um, the second way they were probably understood, and this is what literary scholars have really pointed to, is that to think about them as a kind of, again, a kind of a narrative where the things take the place of people and they therefore they kind of find a way in which they um, talk about the rise of novel, the rise of experiences and the rise of the way people think about humans. And that to me is the most interesting part is how they think about them as humans. Um, and how that becomes part of this dynamic of the enlightenment of moving to understand what's human and what's not. So that's one way to think about how it fits with. I'm not sure we know, or at least the literary scholars have not written that much about the reception of these ideas, but that it's really been much more about the production of these ideas. Um, so we do know, I know, for example, that the ones that I chose to illustrate were not part of that genre of it narratives published in booklet form, they're in newspapers. And so, and so in that way, they were much more commonly understood. I mean, I have one from Ben Franklin. It's the life of a, of a ceramic. But it's all these ideas about how people could encounter these ideas about objects being humanized. That's so fascinating that they were being disseminated through these um, you know, early mass media. The other thing I was wondering too is, do you think there's something specific to the colonial context um, that made these narratives particularly meaningful or charged? You know, the fact that a lot of these objects were being imported from England, for example, did it give those objects a kind of extra strangeness or, you know, were they kind of marketing tools? Um, I think your question goes to the essence of the colonial experience and then how it fits within the British Empire. Um, obviously, some of the ideas were very important and that's through the trade and through obviously through the um, printed and painted and written discourse. Um, I do think there's some interesting ways in which um, some of these could play differently. And I'll give you one example, which is a, a, a response from uh, Bob the dog who is kind of like a, these animals also become these other characters. And one of those he, he describes, he's this dog and he's being carried around to different places, different experiences. And he goes to Jamaica and he sees enslaved people. And he's really puzzled by this. Um, who are these people? How do, they, how do they fit with humans? And he does this kind of puzzled dog thing where he says, um, well, they're up with two legs. So they're like humans, but they're not treated like humans. 
so that it's part of this trying to figure out these things that were confusing. So that's part, of course, part of the British discourse about slavery we've heard so much about in this, this session um, or in this conference. But I do think it, it could possibly play within the colonial context in a different way that we might think about that in the British way. But obviously, they're both sharing this um, this con this confluence of ideas of the printed and the and the public world and the world of objects. Thank you. Um, the other question I had uh, for Sammy and Suzanne is this uh, question of architecture, which we've you know explored in the other panels as well. Um, is it something? Was it something about glass in particular? in an architectural setting that lent itself to sort of spectacle. Um, you know, was there any play, for example, with the Ida Fusicon between the setting, um, and I think they were originally in sort of private households, right? Um, and the sort of transparent window that you see where those images would be moving and whatnot. Um, sort of interested, I guess, in the site uh, in which, the sites in which these glass paintings um, were placed. I, I'm quite happy to have a go with that first, if that's okay with, with, with Sammy. I'm, I'm, the glass paintings went into buildings for elites. So you're talking about palaces country houses and therefore they would have been accessible only to a few people. The buildings where I suppose the glass paintings would have been more widely accessible would have been churches. So the ecclesiastical pictures would have been available to, to all. And I suspect that there is some, some link with medieval colored glass painting in that people would see a, a window, remember what was done before and perhaps may have, I'm speculating here, thought, hey, there's a space, there's a window. How can we decorate it? How can we beautify it? How can we say something about our, ourselves or, or how can we um, actually enhance the space that, that we are in? How can we shade or moderate or modulate the light? And there, there was there was a space, so it, it it could be it could be utilized. I know it seems counterintuitive because in 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 a number of situations today, and I'm I'm looking out of one even now, and it, and it's dark. It, it's a window, and you want the light to come in. So why why do you why do you want to? then play with it and start obscuring it. Um, you, you can draw a blind or a, a curtain or a pull a shutter if, if you want to change the light in that way. But no, the, the, the Georgians were up for experimentation and, and so that, that's what they wanted to do. And then I think there is a link with the Ido Fusicon, if you will, which did go into um, a sort of a theater and entertainment space. Although some people did have them at, at home, I think Gainsborough had a go at making one. He painted on glass himself and made his own. I, I think it was an, an outing and an experience away from the home and out into, into the social scene. Let, let's go see a show. Let, let's, go, let's go pay our money and go and watch the Ido Fusicon e experience. I think well, what you're saying, Suzanne, about the fact that you know these are windows in the house, that's really important for how we're studying these. Because especially in these great houses, it's really hard to track down records of things like painted glass because they don't quite fall into any of the categories of other sort of inventories. Um, same when I've got sort of lithophanes mounted in um, stained glass, which is, is, isn't quite actually a lot of houses, but they're just not part of the record because where do they fit in? They're not part of the fine art collection, but they're also, you know, it's the architecture stuff that's usually that's very much sort of the nuts and bolts that's going through there. So they sort of slip through the cracks, so they don't fit into these categories. Um, and as well as Suzanne, I was thinking we were sort of talking about the uh, sort of more um, the theatrical commercial side. Of course, so much of this um, we've both mentioned, these were seen in exhibitions. This is a culture that really starts to rise, actually showing things in exhibitions before they're being put into their permanent place. 
Um, so that a lot of the time, you know, there, there may be sort of a multi-layered viewing experience where it might be seen first in exhibition and then again in a private home. Um, I was thinking as well, um, because uh, Adrian Tinniswood has, I think, quite persuasively proved that actually there is this really big culture of tourism to the 18th century houses that's really established by them. And we do start to see things like painted glass actually um, recorded in some of these guidebooks that start to be published. So that it is something to be seen in the house. It's, it's very much is still a feature there, which then, of course, is very different to the exhibition context. Uh, especially sometimes where you'd see the painted glass put next to an original painting. Um, like for instance, William Collins did with his version of John Martin's Belshazzar's Feast. And this caused an actual sensation. The painting itself was a real sensation when it was first exhibited in the Royal Academy. Um, and, but actually being put next to painted glass as well. It, again, it really causes this emotion. People to go, actually, wow, this is really interesting. Um, so yeah, yeah, the display is just so interesting. No, it's and it's I, there's something too to be said about the sort of creation of experiences through visual yeah. effects, um, but those being quite cited in specific places. So this process of being transported to another place actually depends upon the fixity of the glass in an architectural mm -hmm. setting, as opposed to the examples that Anne was talking about, where you have these mobile objects, right, that are traveling from. England, the metropole to a colonial context. And really it's less about the sort of transportation of an experience, but the object itself narrating its own journey um, and its own sort of place um, and kind of constructing a place for itself uh, that I find really interesting. And these sort of, you know, two sides of the same coin in a really um, fascinating way. Yeah, Suzanne, go ahead. I, I was really fascinating by Anne's, talk because I very little painted glass made its way across the Atlantic. Um, it made some it made its way to Russia. Um, again, I think because of political and monarchical connections also to Holland. Um, the, in the late Georgian period, it made its way to India when um, Christian churches and cathedrals were being built in India. Some painted glass made its way there. But I do know Benjamin Franklin certainly looked at mechanical paintings and said they have the Americans at the moment were just too practical to to want to export um, something like a mechanical painting. Yes, the technology is interesting, but you know we we can't see that catching on here. So I I do wonder about the the export of of objects, glass or otherwise, and I know they were fragile. Was it, was it a, a a case of the objects had to have some sort of utility as well that the colonial experienced valued useful objects, no matter how beautiful. Um, and if something wasn't useful as well as beautiful, then perhaps there was less of a market for it across the Atlantic. I think there's a couple of different things going on here. And one goes back to Iris's question as well, which is how do we think about this in terms of trade and the experience of the colonial, of colonial peoples? Um, one is that if we return to the idea of kind of this polite um, environment with this aesthetic set of ideas about architecture and other forms, certainly the most elite in America have absolute connectedness to what should be and what might be. That doesn't mean that they performed it similarly or especially the same. And Franklin and others do point to that idea of we well, really like yourself, it's practical, uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not equally um, transported by the most elite um, into those kinds of ideas about aesthetics and what have you. Now, do we know that none of these were found? I don't think that the literature or you, your work and others have made that, have confirmed that, but that we don't know uh, about these very high style painted forms are just not in the public setting. Uh, now, does this mean that everybody's different? But you know, but I'm saying that there's a different set of ideas about what is appropriate. And that includes the idea that there are different forms of interest, um, but there's certainly a lot of aesthetic things that are being important as well. My work in stores, I mean, these are not the top, top end, but certainly, uh, we can find all kinds of the silks um, and the certain set of ideas about mirrors and environment are certainly there, but not to that degree. 
Does that make sense? Suzanne, I wonder too if, you know, given the quite experimental nature of these paintings and the fact that, you know, they didn't know the market in the colonies and whether they would be accepted um, or purchased, you know, it's a pretty different thing if you send creamware, which everyone was just going to use and, and buy. I wonder if it was partly a market consideration that the cost of shipping it to the colonies and not knowing for sure if there was going to be a market for it kind of ended up affecting um, its presence there to a certain degree. Um, undoubtedly, I, I, I can imagine that um, those trading across the Atlantic would would want to be certain that what they take across was going to be sold and, and would get the best price for the weight of the cargo. And I'm, I'm getting very close to, to on getting onto thin ice again there, but um, yeah, some hard hard business decisions would would be made um, for the time in which in which we speak, and they they would go for profit, of course. and, and of course. that 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 would be a very hard decision. It certainly is a business, and it certainly things are going back and forth, and things are sent back or say, "Don't send me this again." My one other point would be that I'm looking at this idea of enlightenment ideas. And there's a letter in which um, Jefferson is very excited about the new argon lamp. And he sends it to Charles Thompson, who was another member of Congress. And he says, this is just great. And Charles Thompson replies to this is great, thank you so much. But then he starts talking about enlightenment ideas. And he started talking about the ideas of new um, manufacturing ideas, or new ideas. He says, I don't know very much about that, but I hear it's true. So it's that idea of a, set of ideals, the elite and the educated that perform in one way, but then there's a secondary commercial aspect as well. Thank you so much. And I believe, and I'm so sorry, I didn't have a chance to um, incorporate the questions in the chat and the Q&A, but I believe we should be wrapping up to move on to our final panel. So thank you so much, Anne, Sammy, and Suzanne for a really fantastic panel.